Our keynote speaker, Sanjeev Arora, is the uh, Charles C. Fitzmorris Professor of Computer Science at Princeton and uh, member and professor at the Institute for Advanced Study. He, um, his work in theoretical machine learning has won him numerous awards, including the Fulkerson Prize and the ACM Sys, uh, Infosys Foundation Award. Um, so we're extremely excited to have him here. He's been leading this uh, theory of ML, uh, year of ML theory at the IAS and is very much a, a, a pillar of our uh, community. So let's welcome. Uh, Scott? Thank you. So um, yeah, I've been giving this talk for a few months now. So apologies if you've seen it before, but hopefully there'll be something new uh, in every iteration. Nadab Cohen, grad, uh, postdoc at the time, now faculty member at Tel Aviv. Um, uh, Wei Hu, uh, I mentioned Yu Ping Luo, another grad student at Princeton. Uh, and then in the last one, a few grad students. So similar group, Holden Lee, another one. Uh, grad student, Ronga, colleague at Duke, Rohit Kuriripudi, and uh, Zhao Wang uh, are students at Duke. All right, so uh, optimization. Is it the right learning for understanding deep learning? And uh, I want to emphasize what I mean by optimization. And possibly for some of you, it's a blinkered view of optimization. But here what, here's what it is, that optimization means you, you set yourself an objective, a mathematical objective, and your goal is to just find the optimum value for that objective, the, the theta that optimizes that. And as a bonus in optimization, you try to do it as fast as possible. But yeah, you are looking for the best. And how many people think that's not optimization? Okay, no dissidents here. Maybe by the end of the talk, you'll start arguing with me, because this has happened. And you say, wait a second. All right, but anyway, so my main point is, you know, if this is your view of optimization, maybe we need to go beyond that. So now, of course, I know there are many neuroscientists here. So in neuroscience, of course, there is this old debate, right? Does the brain, which is spiking neurons in a vat of chemicals, does it amount to optimization of an objective? And the jury's still out. And, um, and, of course, it's assumed that deep learning, of course, by contrast, is optimizing an objective, right? There's a training objective. You do gradient descent or some other algorithm on it. And the suggestion I'm making today is that deep net training is also imperfectly captured by the value of the objective. Okay, and to just give away the, the punchline here, look, when you say you, your problem is captured as optimization, you're committing yourself to accepting any solutions that come out of that optimization algorithm, right? And that's not what we want in deep learning. Okay, so I'm giving away that punchline, and I'll illustrate now. All right, so what is the main issue in deep learning, the 800-pound gorilla in the room? Overfitting or generalization, okay? Uh, yes, optimization is tough, but okay, we seem to have a handle on it, but what we don't have a very good handle on uh, at all is generalization. And by that, I'm referring to the phenomenon that you can tra train nets with 50 million or 100 million, a billion parameters on 50,000 training examples, and it still generalizes. So it's as if you know, Occam's rule or Occam's law has been suspended, right? <laughs> After a thousand years, somehow, it's been suspended. And the traditional ex explanation in deep learning theory and in general machine learning theory is that, well, there's an objective, and to make it generalize, you throw in a regularizer. And that this regularizer controls the capacity and you know, dimensionality, there are all these buzzwords. All right, but there are experiments showing, uh, and you can go home and check this on your own GPUs, that Current deepness are so over-parameterized that you throw in regularizer, throw in all your optimization tricks that are being done in practice, and they can still attain almost zero training error, error even on randomly labeled data. And I think there was even a talk this morning that talked about this phenomenon. So, so now if you think about that, the easy implication is that you, know, you can take your data and add some randomly labeled data, and the deep net can still fit that. And so there are lots of solutions to the optimization problem, right, which are attaining zero loss on your data. 
So the objective is gazillion minima, or almost minima. And it's not the case that we are happy with any one of them, okay? So that's, in that sense, it's not like optimization. And in fact, what I'm trying to say here again, to phrase it in a different way, is that normally you think of the optimization objective as some kind of a, uh, of a score for a symphony, right? Something like this. So it's just a representation of what's going to happen in the next hour as you listen to the symphony. And I'm suggesting that actually maybe the objective is a very vague or somewhat vague description. Maybe not quite as this vague, but you know, something like to drive home the point. You know, some description like it has four movements, these are the keys and the themes. And it ends with the ode to joy, and somehow that's a description of the symphony. Well, that is, but it's a very rough description of the symphony, right? And you need the proper conductor to do it. Yes. Can but, I start with a yeah. clarifying question? Yeah. So you, you exclude the possibility that the same regularization term will work fine with real data and not with regularization term. My, my problem is not with the regularization term. My, my problem is that the regularization does not imply generalization. Firstly, you can just train with vanilla gradient descent, and that works pretty fine too. You don't need regularization. Okay, so uh, so why is that? You know, why is uh, objective an imperfect score for what happens during training? Well, because the non-convex landscape it has multiple minima, as we already discussed, and any tweak to training, tweak the learning rate, tweak the momentum, any of the hyperparameters, same architecture will induce a different trajectory, this we know, and can end up with a different solution, this we also know. And it's the trajectory properties during the training that determine generalization, and not the objective value, nor how fast the objective was made zero. You can have algorithms which speed up the optimization or the training, and then end up with worse generalization. Okay, so uh, there's a lovely phrase for this uh, from my colleagues at TTI Chicago, uh, Nati Srebro's group, Nesha Buraral, Gunasekar Aral, where they call it the implicit bias of gradient descent. And actually, this has been talked about in optimization for decades as well. Like in simple settings like um, sparse regression, the optimization algorithm you use can be viewed as doing different kinds of regularization. Okay, so the different optimization algorithms have a different implicit bias. And so it's a lovely uh, phrase. But somehow, uh, I'll talk about later, uh, talk later, like why I'm not completely happy with that phrasing either. Like that's too much related to or tied to optimization, and I think it's just not optimization. So in, in a nutshell, I propose replacing optimization in deep learning with the word training. It's a training algorithm, and you change the algorithm a little bit, it's a different training algorithm. It's not the same optimization. All right, so uh, actually I'll skip this one, you know, for those of you, yes. Very much. I'm, I, I'm not claiming that. I'm not claiming that. So the question was, am I claiming there exists no objective that could explain it? I'm not claiming that. And that's exactly why that's an open problem for neuroscience. Someday somebody will think hard and come up with an objective. But at least the way we, you know, with the objective we have, that objective is not capturing training. Someday somebody may come up with a perfect objective. So that's why I do have a question in my title. Is it the right language? <laughs> All right, so this I won't actually dwell on too much. This slide was from a, uh, a, a workshop a few weeks ago where you know, there were more optimization people. But you may have seen vaguely you know, these analyses of optimization, of first order optimization, gradient descent, using smoothness, et cetera. And you know, it, has, it, you know, it, it doesn't really explain many things. For instance, you, know, you change the learning rate uh, and the optimization may completely change, et cetera. You know, I mean, the training may completely change. So the point is, you know, the point of this slide was that there's this black box view in which optimization is analyzed. You know, the function is a black box with you just know about something about its norm of the gradient or norm of the second derivative, et cetera, and then everything works. And that black box view is very insufficient at, at the very minimum. So my talk is going to be about four papers, as I mentioned, and each is a vignette in the talk. And so obviously I won't give you full details of any one paper, but I hope to give you a, a broad perspective of, of the issue. So vignette one, training of infinitely wide deep nets. Okay, and I'll say what that is. But the, the, uh, the, uh, the 
subtitle here is that gradient descent will pick out a meaningful solution out of infinitely many possibilities. So as we discussed, in real life deepness, there are many solutions, many optima, and somehow you want the right one. Here, there are going to be infinitely many optima, and still gradient descent will pick out something meaningful. With, I, I, I'm describing, yeah. I'm just setting the, roughly the thing, and so I'll define it more pre uh, precisely. And the motivations here are things that people here may have seen, for instance, thermodynamic limit in, in physics, or the Gaussian process view of deep learning, et cetera. And width, by the way, is number of nodes in a fully connected layer, just what you think of as width. Or if it's convolutional net, then the number of channels in the convolutional circuit. And that's going to go to infinity, where the input and output layers will remain fixed. So you can still train on the same old data sets, CIFAR, MNIST, et cetera. All right, to just illustrate with a concrete example. Suppose you take a very small classic data set, like one of these UCI data sets, very tiny data set you know, from 20 years ago. How many people even remember UCI? It used to be big in machine learning. So multi-class, in this case, this primary tumor data set, 17 dimensional input, very tiny. Number of training samples, 331, okay? you're going to train a fully connected five-layer net on it, okay? Now, turns out people actually tried this a couple of years ago. I'll mention the paper later. Um, and actually, it's not completely ridiculous to train this net with a million parameters on this tiny data set. It actually does something reasonable. This was actually a paper, uh, I think, last year or two years ago. But I'm going to make, make it even more ridiculous. It's going to be infinitely wide. It's not just million parameters. It's infinitely wide. All right, so just to draw a picture, there are five layers, and the input and output layer is the sa uh, same as usual, and the, and the intermediate layers are going to infinity, fully connected. And you're going to initialize with suitably scaled Gaussians. That makes sense in the infinite limit. So you're it's not really infinite. You're thinking of it as an infinite limit, okay? So the width is some number, and you're thinking of the, that going to infinity and imagining what happens. And the initialization is well-defined, you know, in the infinite limit, et cetera. So now you're thinking, well, this is too expressive. I mean, we've all seen the basic representa representation theory for deep nets, or for neural nets. And we know that if you have an arbitrarily wide layer, then even with two layers, meaning one hidden layer, you can basically represent any finite function. So, and even infinite functions, you know, under some modest conditions. So, so clearly the number of zero loss solutions goes to infinity, right? For any, you can fit any finite data set, and I only have 339 examples, right? So there are inf uh, the number of solutions goes to infinity. All right? Plus, of course, it's infeasible to train. Infinite. Doesn't fit in any GPU. Well, and what, I, what I'm saying is that actually you can. You can come up with a number. How well does it do on this data set? And that number in this case was 51.5. And the reason I mentioned that was that these small data sets, you know, it's, it's been hard to, you know, beat classical methods like Random forest, boosted, boosted decision trees, Gaussian kernel, et cetera. And this infinite net is actually better. Okay, as I'll, I'll talk more about that later. All right, so let's first talk about this infinite limit and what that means and how you can compute this number, you know, the performance on a finite data set. So here's a reminder of what the infinite limit do, may allow you to do. So the original thermodynamic limit was uh, like the analysis of the velocities of particles in a gas. And of course, in a finite gas, the particles are bouncing around. And as they bounce around, they exchange momentum. So velocities change. And if you actually plot the histogram of velocities, it sort of uh, changes with time. But in the infinite limit, Maxwell and Boltzmann uh, uh, showed that actually this, in the infinite limit, all of these discrete numbers, the velocities of the individual particles, smears out into a distribution, which is this continuous distribution. So you could imagine that as you take the infinite limit, the infinitely wide limit of a deep net, all these individual neurons in the layers, right, which are discrete entities, they, their values smear into your distribution for the layer. Okay, some density distribution of values, and that you can compute potentially, right? And if you think about it, you may be able to do that, right? You compute the distribution here, next layer, et cetera. Okay, and you can get an arbitrarily close approximation in finite time. All right, so that's, uh, that's indeed what happens. So this is called the neural, ta neural tangent kernel, and there's a convolutional analog which we defined. So the first notion was from Jekyll et al. 
And uh, the theorem that comes out, you know, from this infinite limit, the serial infinite limit, is that this gradient descent training on this infinite, infinite width net, meaning you take the finite net and imagine the limit going to infinity. What gradient descent does on that in the infinite limit can be captured as kernel least square regression with respect to this neural tangent kernel. Okay, and this neural tangent kernel depends only on the architecture. So you take the architecture, fully connected, convolution, whatever, blow the width to infinity, and it, 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 it morphs, it changes into this kernel and the behavior is described by the kernel. Okay, and uh, as I indicated already, because you know, it's uh, just you know, multi -layer, finite number of layers of distributions, there can be potentially an algorithm, a dynamic programming algorithm that computes a distribution to some arbitrary precision. And that's indeed possible. And even for convolutional neural tangent kernel, there's a GPU-friendly algorithm for computing this kernel exactly. So that's the paper. And that's why you can compute the exact performance of an infinite width map on finite data sets. Okay? So just to give you uh, some sense of the theory, you know, how this is made mathematically precise. So this is for fully connected nets, uh, completely analogous for uh, for convolutional, just more complicated. So fully connected net, you have a uh, bunch of matrices, which are the layers. There's a nonlinearity or activation sigma. The, uh, the weights are initialized as a standard Gaussian. Layer weights, are, we'll imagine them going to infinity. We're going to train the net with square loss. Okay, the, the simplest theory that you get off infinite nets is using square, squared loss. So that. And now you can analyze the dynamics of gradient descent. And this is just standard or simple calculus. You can write the dynamics of gradient descent. So u is the output of the net. And uh, so I'm thinking of you know, the, all the data points. You know, so the, the output on each of those data points, that's a vector. So that's the change of vector. This is a change of that vector with time, the output of the vector on the different inputs, finite number of inputs. On the right-hand side, you have the same vector, and the y is the label vector, okay, the labels of the data points. And h is this matrix, uh, which is like this, okay, the, the, uh, which is this uh, uh, positive semi-definite matrix where, uh, where the components are the gradient of the output with respect to the weight parameters. Okay, so the ij entry is the inner product of the gradient for the ith output, for the uh, output on the ith input, and the output of the jth input, the gradient of those. Okay, so this is elementary calculus, and the question is what happens in the limit as the weights go to infinity, and that that's what you can show that this this kernel, you know, even though it's evolving, I mean this matrix, sorry, this uh, h matrix, even though it's evolving, actually it approaches. It, 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 is, it stays close to this fixed limit, h star, over, the, over its evolution, which means, and if you look at that, you know where this matrix is fixed, that's this L2 regression with respect to that kernel, h. And it's positive semi-definite, remember. So that's the, that's the, uh, that's the result, that, that's the statement. And uh, yeah, sorry, I did switch, yeah, w -O -O Right, it's all layers, yes. Okay, yeah, so yeah. that's right. I'm not distinguishing between the layers here. L is fixed. L is fixed, yes. The weights are going to infinity, yes. Um, all right, proof idea, as you would imagine, there's an induction on depth, uh, and uh, you use properties of the Gaussian matrices, and you have to control or estimate the change in the norm of the vectors during training. So the, the parameters change a little bit, but not enough to change the properties of the Gaussian initialization. So it's sort of sticking close to the initialization. Okay. So that's the theorem. I'll just unpack that previous slide a little bit. You know, what is that theorem saying? And this is really a reminder of what kernel methods are. Kernel regression, kernel SVM. So, okay, going back 20, 25 years in our field, what was popular was these reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which you can think of as a new representation for the input. So it's uh, a mapping from the input space to this infinite dimensional space, and x maps to phi of x, and uh, examples of phi are like polynomial kernel, Gaussian kernel, et cetera. 
And now you're going to do your classification on this infinite representation. Okay, it's a Hilbert space. Now, of course, that's infeasible, but the algorithm is feasible if, uh, you know, it's possible if you can, given the input x1, a pair x1, x2, you can compute the inner product of these two infinitely wide vectors. And that you can do in closed form for some of these kernels. Okay, so that's the kernel trick. And once, if you can do that for the kernel, then you can run SVM, regression, et cetera, because they only need inner product. Okay, so neural tangent kernel is a new kernel uh, that was defined as part of this research. And what is that kernel? So in this infinite, infinite width embedding, each coordinate corresponds to a parameter in the net. And remember, the number of parameters is going to infinity. And the corresponding entry is the partial derivative of the output of the network with respect to that parameter at time t equals zero. So that's the kernel, the new kernel that's been defined. Okay, and a priori it's not clear that you have closed form calculation of this uh, inner product, but actually there is. Okay, so that's what you do. Okay, so that's why you can determine what this infinite width net is doing. By the way, you know, once you have this kernel, you can also train SVMs using that kernel, and which we do in some of the experiments. But what that SVM train on this kernel means in terms of the neural net is not clear, and that's theory to be developed. All right, so going back to this finite small data set, UCI. So by the way, we've applied this kernel up to CIFAR 10. It's very hard to apply kernel methods to ImageNet because kernel methods are quadratic in the number of training examples. It's kind of hilarious, you know, kernel methods are supposed to be easy and deep learning was supposed to be hard. But deep learning actually works in time linear in the input, number of inputs, and then, sorry, the number of training examples, whereas kernel methods are quadratic, naively, in the number of training examples. So you, we cannot apply this method to ImageNet, but we applied it to CIFAR 10 and so on. But to really drive home the point, we applied it on these simple classic uh, uh, data sets like UCI, where it had been very hard to beat the classic things like random forest and uh, Gaussian kernels and so on. And there NTK actually beats them on this classic uh, test bed by Fernando Delgares et al., the UCI. And it beats it on all the <coughs> measures of performance over the aggregated 90 data sets. And as that, we also uh, applied it to uh, CIFAR 10. And there have been a couple of papers where we did that. And in the new one, which is a manuscript, uh, we have a souped up CNTK that rivals AlexNet, the original Hinton net from 19, sorry, from 2012 on CIFAR 10, so 80, 89%. So that's been actually very difficult to do with a kernel method, but this kernel you get out of infinitely wide nets actually can, uh, can match that. And this kernel is sort of uh, is souped up in the sense that we introduced a local average pooling operation uh, inside the kernel which incorporates the effect of data augmentation. Data augmentation is this interesting technique that, uh, let's say you have MNIST digits, you're training on that, you augment them by taking like translations of the MNIST digits or rotations, et cetera, and train on that as well. And so this local average pooling incorporates the effect of data augmentation. I mean, the reason you, oh, oh sorry, I forgot to say, we, data augmentation is a great idea. Reason it's difficult to do with a kernel method is that it increases the number of training samples. And as we know, the running time is quadratic in the number of training samples. So data augmentation is bad news for a kernel method, but we incorporate it in the, in the kernel by some architectural feature. All right. Which brings us to the point that we thought we understood everything about kernels, but actually several authors now have pointed out that when you start thinking about deep nets, you realize that kernels are some kind of a subcase, and actually we don't understand why they generalize. Okay, the generalization theory for even kernels is not very well developed. So that's an open problem for the people here who are, look, who are looking to work on this. Okay, I'm on to the next uh, vignette. Any questions? So the point of this was you can define infinitely wide nets, and going back to the optimization thing, there are infinitely many solutions to the optimization problem. Not all of them are good, most of them are terrible, but gradient descent does something intelligent. Yes. Once you have found the deep learning, yes. You cannot r run the deep learning over, it's infinite. Which is the kernel method, yes. Yeah, but then you do complex learning. You can't do optimal model where you are going to 
Correct. As I said, we don't have a theory for you take this kernel, the NTK kernel, which corresponds to L2 regression. And just L2, you can do L2 regression, and that's fine too. But SVM in some cases does better. Correct. Not dimension in the number of number training of samples. Yes. No, and there's no dimension. Yeah. No. The kernel has no adjustable parameters. So that was the question. What is the number? So there's no adjustable parameters in the kernel, right? It's a fixed kernel. You can compute the kernel given the data. Well, no. Oh, sorry. The kernel is defined for any data set, of course. You don't, you don't compute a kernel, right? So there's no closed form formula like Gaussian kernel. But given any n data points, you can compute the kernel matrix on the data points. That's what you compute. Yeah. The kernel has no closed form here. Yeah. Yes. L2. Yeah. The, the theory is developed for L2. And now there's a, a analysis of also logistic loss, but not SVM loss. It's something gives something analysis. Yes. Oh yeah, I forgot to say that. Yes, good. So. Uh, the question was, you know, how does the NTK correspond to the, uh, to the finite net? And I forgot to say that. Yeah, you take a finite net like VGG or whatever, LXNet. You go to the infinite limit, and the performance does drop. Not a lot, but it does drop. What makes it worse is that, you know, in today's state-of-the-art deep net, you know, it's not LXNet anymore, right? So you need batch norm. There's no theory for NTK for batch norm. Uh, you have data augmentation. There's no general theory, although we have now something. So yeah, there's a difference. When you go to the infinite limit, we, don't, we just have this one limit we understand, the NTK limit. There are all kinds of other things in deep learning that happen for which we have no infinite limit. And may, maybe they don't exist. So this is all a fertile area for research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can add uh, regularization in the kernel, yeah. That's very interesting. So the question is about the effect of depth. And actually, you know, it's not like monotone increasing, decreasing. Yeah, it's, there's no theory for it. I mean, experimentally, we, yeah, in a. Yeah, but that wasn't true. Seven per layer. You can do all kinds of things, yeah. yeah. So this is all like hot of the presses, right? Like the papers are, the first papers are appearing in Europe. So yeah, young people here or, or older people, yeah, if they're interested in working on it. Maybe I'll move on, okay? So I hope I got at least the major questions. Vignette two, solving matrix completion via deep linear nets. Okay, so clearly the training algorithm has a profound influence on what solution gets uh, produced and you know, what its properties are. So can we understand it in a, some simple setting? And this is what it's gonna, you know, so this, uh, this is what the TTI group was doing the last couple of years. They were trying to formalize the effect of gradient descent in some simple setting. So we're going to visit that. And, we'll, and our conclusion will be that actually formalizing gradient descent effects on even the simple setting is tricky. And this is a paper with Nadav Cohen, Weihu, and Yu Ping Luo. So matrix completion, another blast from the past. <laughs> uh, how many people remember this? Yeah. So yeah, as I, as I said, there, it was related to this Netflix challenge. So this is in the days when Netflix was about renting you DVDs, and, and they wanted to predict, based on the 20 DVDs you liked and rated, which DVDs would you like next. So you can think of it as a giant matrix user times movies, and some of the entries in the matrix have been revealed, and you're trying to figure out the remaining entries. So that's why it's called matrix completion. And the, the assumption was this giant matrix has low rank. Otherwise, this is impossible. So there's an unknown low rank matrix, n by n matrix. Entries are revealed in a random subset omega of locations. Recover ramp, the remaining entries. So a classic algorithm by Strebro et al. Uh, 
show, uh, suggested this algorithm where you're trying to find a matrix via least square uh, fit. So the revealed entries are omega. So in those places, matrix has to fit them exactly or least square sense. And then, obviously, there are infinitely many matrices that do that, right, because it's a subset of entries. You want to constrain the set of matrices, and that's uh, this nuclear norm regularizer. So M star, which is the sum of singular values of this unknown matrix. Okay, so the variables are, here are the matrix entries, and the singular values is thrown into the regularizer, M star, the sum of singular values. And the, the heuristic was that low rank should somehow, the, the convex relaxation of that would be this quantity, which is the sum of singular values, and this happens to be convex in the entries of M. So that's why they proposed this. So there was a lot of study of this, uh, which the old timers re uh, remember, and uh, culminating in this result that this is statistically optimal. And I put optimal in square, scare quotes because, as you can probably guess, there's some surprises left. All right, so coming to deep learning, Gunasekhar et al., the, uh, the TTI group, also including Srebro, uh, they said, well, let's try to do it with a pure gradient descent. So instead of finding this unknown matrix M, you know, entry by entry, I'm going to find it as a product of two unknown matrices, W1 and W2. All right, so now, and I'm, so I'm finding W1 and W2, and their product has to fit the revealed entries. And that's it. No regularization. This seems nuts, right? Because clearly, even here, if you didn't put the regularizer in, there are infinitely many solutions. And who knows, you know, and in general, the optimization or the training would just overfit. So here you have even more variables. Instead of one matrix, you have two matrices. And the product has to fit the review variables. Now, the, the point is this is exactly a linear net. It's formally equivalent to, it is formally a subcase of deep learning where the training examples correspond to omega and the testing is on all entries of the matrix. So that's the test, uh, test data. And this uh, predicting the unknown entries is exactly like generalization. Sorry, yeah. Uh, here I'm talking n by n. Yeah. No, no, w's are square. Correct. Oh. No rank constraint. Oh. That's right. Oh. That's right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So people have done the rank version. No rank constraints. It seems ridiculous. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Okay. So the question was, does W have a rank constraint? Like you, you know what the rank R should be, and you put R. That's actually worse than what this is. Overparameterization helps, as is often the case in deep learning. All right, so infinitely many solutions. But, and that's what they showed, you do gradient descent on this, okay? And formally, it's just back propagation because it's a composition of two functions, right? W2 and W1. And empirically, gradient descent finds solutions as good as nuclear normalization. What does that mean? Well, you, you see, you know, all the settings where that works, this works just as well. So their conjecture was that in depth two linear nets, gradient descent has an imp implicit regularization effect, which is equivalent to nuclear net. So in, put in other words, there's a ghost regularizer. You're just doing gradient descent on this objective, but there's a ghost regularizer in the background, which is shaping your gradient descent. So to use my earlier analogy, right, of the Beethoven symphony, right? So the score that you're given is not really a score, it's like a very imprecise description. And there's a ghost of Beethoven out there who, as the conductor is conducting, is sort of making sure the right thing comes out. Very bizarre stuff. Okay, lovely. And so they call it the implicit bias of gradient descent. Yes, gradient descent has a bias, but mathematically it's equivalent to something we understand. All right. So in this new paper, we, uh, we said, okay, let's try three layers, four layers. And we had some intuition, as you can guess, that this would be nice. So we, n layers, okay? So now you're looking for the unknown matrix as a product of n matrices. n is three, let's say, even. And again, you're no rank constraints. And you're again going to do gradient descent. This takes the normal uh, mantra or religion of deep learning to an extreme limit, right? You're just gonna trust backprop. You have domain knowledge that this end-to-end -end matrix should be low rank. That's your domain knowledge. You're ignoring the domain knowledge and just gonna trust backprop, right? It's taking that 
mantra or religion to an extreme. Well, good news. Empirically, this solves matrix completion better than nuclear non minimization or depth two. So, depth three is better than depth two. So, what do I mean by that? So, better than nuclear non minimization. So, so when you reveal fewer and fewer entries, at some point, nuclear non minimization stops working very well. This continues to work. Okay, so, uh, so you know, th th this is some, uh, you're looking at some reconstruction on some. Uh, Synthetic data, you know, product, you know, some random matrix, a matrix that's a product of, the unknown matrix is a product of two random rank R matrices. And uh, uh, so depth two has some reconstruction error on this, uh, in this, with this particular number of reveal entries, and depth three is better by several, a couple orders of magnitude, and depth four is just slightly better. Okay, so three gives the most improvement, and, and all in the theory suggests that too. Okay, so that's the empirical stuff. That's good news one. Okay, so whatever that ghost regularizer is out there, it's working even harder here. Uh, good news too, there's some math, okay, some analysis. So this analysis is in the setting of gradient flow, okay? We don't know how to analyze finite step gradient descent, but you analyze it as a gradient flow and then it becomes differential equation, again, as in the NTK case. Uh, and then you can analyze how this, the various layers are evolving and how the end-to-end -end matrix is evolving and, and its singular values. And the singular values do this dance, which is kind of very strange. Uh, it's a phenomenon where the arch singular value is growing according to its, its magnitude. And the rich get richer, okay? The larger ones grow even faster. And the interpretation is that the goal of gradient descent is to make the singular vectors of M aligned with those of the uh, those of the loss, which is also a matrix. And the singular directions grow one by one, not all at once. Okay, so the rich get richer. The rich get there first. And the experiment showed there's a difference between depth two and depth three. The depth two, the singular values are all growing simultaneously, albeit at different rates. And depth three really shoots them up one by one. So it's qualitatively different. And um, yeah, there's still much theory to be done here. You know, we is really a qualitative theory of why this is working, but quantitative bounds with finite learning rates, et cetera, is much more difficult. Those of you who've thought about differential equations know that finite, finite step analysis is much harder. Okay, so those are the good news. And other news, uh, we give evidence that this Gunasekar et al. conjecture for depth two is actually false, that you know there isn't this path characterization of the ghost regularizer. Uh, uh, another uh, example that Adam, which is this other deep learning algorithm, training algorithm, it optimizes much, much faster than gradient descent, but it generalizes worse. Okay, so again, going back to the story that optimization is not what's going on here. It's some properties of training algorithms. Uh, and also some mathematical evidence that the gradient descent trajectory has no characterization in terms of the usual matrix norms. Okay, that's sort of more uh, an insider kind of thing, but yeah, there's, there's some interesting evidence. Okay, so gradient descent has great properties, or training algorithms has great properties, but quantifying the effect will be a, a tough battle where you have to work it out in all kinds of different cases, I think. Okay, so that's the take, take away of that vignette. Any quick questions there? Yes. Empirical, empirical, yes. Yeah, the only theory is that, the, the kind of theory I mentioned earlier, yes. Yes, yes, linear. This is entirely about linear networks. Other, other problems, uh, you know, it works for nonlinear as well, but it's even harder to analyze. So linear we could analyze. Uh, did, did we do Adam on nonlinear? Sorry, I don't remember. Yeah, maybe not. Uh, let's see. Somebody who had an ask a question before. Yes. It was fairly monotone, yeah. But there's no much more benefit. Not much benefit. Four is slightly better than three, and between five and four, not much, I think. But maybe, you know, it's just on this one data set, right? Synthetic. Maybe it makes a difference somewhere else. Yes, in the back. De deterministic, yeah. Stochastic works too, yeah. But in this case, yeah, you just do the full gradient, yeah. And learning rates, finite learning rates work too, but we can't analyze, yes. Another in the front. 
Uh, not much. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so the question was, you know, where's the magic? Is it in the gradient descent or in the geometry of the problem or where? It's probably everywhere. Yeah, I agree. And, and so that's what I was referring to, that, you know, characterizing what's the inductive bias or the ghost regularizer of gradient descent or any other training algorithm. You'll have to fight that battle in every single battlefield separately, I think. It's probably very complicated mathematically. Maybe one last one and then I'll go to the next videos. And I'll take more at the end. The n, the size of the matrix. Uh, I think we tried up to a certain size, but not beyond it. Yeah. No. Oh no, sparsity. Yeah, it does. Yeah, but you said size of the matrix. Yeah. Oh, number of entries observed. Yes, uh, absolutely. So, for some number of entries, you know, trivial algorithms work. Some number of entries, new phenomenalization works. Then that stops working, and then this really is much better. I, I said it, but yeah, repeating it. Okay, a quick question, yeah. I just want to, if you look at the connection between the numbers, what are the analysis of what? Can, CC analysis of what? CK of the data. It's something that is expected that these are projections without any inductive bias. Yeah. Then so I know that theory, and I don't, Thing math that's mathematically rigorous, and this is what we're trying to do, right? In a very simple case, not in nonlinearities, linear to, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know of any theory that predicts anything, what happens, as far as I know. Because all of these, no, so yeah, I mean, I do know some of those works. That theory, I mean, is not mathematically rigorous. So, yeah, yeah. I, I'm very skeptical. Yeah, a three-layer linear net, you train it with gradient descent, all the layers are moving independently. And there's a theory for what that happens. I'm very, very suspicious. From the 1960s, even more so. Okay, Surya has a comment. Yeah, so, all right. So let me say one thing. So. There's a lot of results. People have thought about it for several decades. I agree with that. And all the analysis have holes, including ours, right? Because, you know, we're, we're trying to infer from, like, gradient flow, you know, what happens with finite rates and, you know, all kinds of things. So I think in all the papers I can point to things which are, like, assumed away. Yeah. I think we agree about that. Yeah. Partial theories, yes. All right. So uh, we need three. Exponential learning rate schedule in deep learning. <coughs> to really drive home the point that there's weird stuff going on. That's not explained by optimization. All right, so what is this stuff? Learning rates, traditional optimization. So uh, standard schedule for learning. So learning rate is, of course, step size, right? So uh, you move along the negative gradient direction. But how much? That's given by step size. And in deep learning, it's been shown that you want to decay the learning rate over time. Okay, you start with a high one and make it smaller and smaller, et cetera, over time. There's all kinds of papers that's been written about this phenomenon. Okay, and um, all of those papers are in the optimization view, right? Where the function is a black box. You know, whether you talk about analysis of gradient descent, the classic literature, or, you know, like Langevin dynamics or whatever, right? Which is sort of the more probabilistic view of gradient descent, the stochastic gradient descent. They're all treating the function as a black box, right? And somehow there's something magical about the value of the function, which we now know is not true. Value of the objective is not really dispositive about generalization or anything. So, all right, so there's extensive literature though. All right. This result makes you question a lot of the, the conventional wisdom. It's possible to train today's deep net architectures while growing the learning rate exponentially. In every iteration, there is, you multiply the learning rate by one perceptron. Okay? 
1 plus c, sorry, for some c bigger than 0. And we all know what exponential increase means. Yes, there'll be hundreds of iterations, thousands of iterations. This learning rate will get giant. You're making giant steps. The numbers blow up, the weights. You need full precision, okay, to even, but it works. Okay, and you get equivalent performance as current state of the art. But, I, but we, we knew that before we did the experiment. Why? Because there's theory. A mathematical proof that our schedule, this kind of schedule, is equivalent to existing training schedules that people are already using and using to get good performance. Okay, so this looks outlandish, but at least for some values of exponents, it's equivalent to existing training schedules. So what we are showing is that training deep nets, you know, this learning rate and all these parameters, there's a wide envelope of values that might work. And that envelope contains some crazy things. Uh, the result is for any, okay, all right, here. This is the asterisk. What do I mean by today's deep nets? <laughs> they all use batch norm. Then you see it? Okay, all right, we should talk. Yeah. Uh, so, because, okay, so what I think what uh, you're referring to is batch norm has a, is a layer normalization kind of thing. So it sort of decouples the norm of the layers from the output. But that doesn't imply that exponential learning rate is equal. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So the intuition is, is right. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, all right, so what is this theorem, this theory? So this is the, the standard uh, generic training algorithm for deep learning today, where you have momentum and weight decay, also called L2 regularizer. So you control the norm of the weights. Now remember I started by saying, look, it's all rolled in, right? Optimization, generalization. People think this L2 regularization is for generalization, right? but I'm gonna roll it into the learning weight. Okay, and so this really illustrates to you that this, the traditional ways of thinking about it are somewhat off. All right, so that's the form. The momentum will play no role because I'll just set it to zero for today's talk, but the general theorem is about that. So the for, following is equivalent to the above for nets with batch norm. You zero out the weight decay, momentum stays the same, gamma. You can also change the momentum, actually, the full theorem is allowing you to change the momentum. And then the learning rate schedule is some exponential schedule where alpha is a non-zero root of this quadratic equation. Okay? All right, so the proof uses some trajectory-based analysis. As I said, you know, it's not, it cannot be black box. It's going to use a trajectory. Plus the scale invariance created due to the batch norm. What is scale invariance? That, you know, with some tricks you can, you can have the property that you scale the parameter linearly and the output doesn't change. So in the function space, scaling doesn't change things. So this is true for all state-of-the-art deep nets today. And, and so that has a property that the gradient scales linearly with the scaling. Okay, this, is not, this requires a few lines of proof, but you can show it. So what this means is that the scale can sort of migrate from the parameters to the learning rate, et cetera. Okay, that's what you'll see. Because it, you know, it can move to the, in front of the gradient. And now remember that weight, this L2 regularizer, the reason it's called weight decay is because when you take the gradient, it's effectively like at every step you're trying to scale down the weights by some factor, by constant factor. <laughs> that's given by the weight decay. So that's why it's called weight decay. So how much time do I have now? I, I, I should wrap up in five minutes. So I'll be quick here. So it turns out that you can set up these equivalences that, you know, this trajectory with a certain weight decay and, and learning rate, et cetera, is equivalent to this other trajectory, right? And the reason you can do that is using the properties of batch norm. That, you know, if you imagine this trajectory of theta t with a fixed learning rate eta, and another one with theta t prime and eta prime, you're going to set up two trajectories that are doing the same thing in function space, but with very different learning rate and uh, weight decay, et cetera. And the idea is that, you know, there are these different operators you can define on trajectories. You know, you can apply gradient descent for one step with learning rate eta. 
you can change the parameters by a constant factor, C. That's this operator pi 1. Or pi 2, which is where you change the learning rate by C. So now you can sort of set up these, these equivalences. Like, you know, if you, if you have this state, you can define this state where you multiply the parameters by C and the learning rate by C squared. And now one step of gradient descent actually is like you take the, 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 step, the next state here, the next state here, and it's the same operator applied. So in this one step, you see that you know, if, if, if these two are equivalent, these two are equivalent after one step of gradient descent. And the general proof is just an induction using these kinds of observations, uh, which I'll, yeah. So that's the idea, that you set up these equivalences, and by induction, you show that this sequence of updates on this state is equal to that sequence of updates on that state. So, and yeah, so this is, this just shows, I think the main takeaway here is that there's a vast set of schedules and, and parameter combina hyperparameter combinations that are possible. And there's some bizarre stuff going on in there. And indeed, in some experimental work, we sort of try to combine some of these new possibilities with some of the existing possibilities, and we get slight improvements, et cetera. But that's not the main point of this vignette. The main point is just that you know, there's, this design space is very interesting, and there's interesting stuff going on. So last one, uh, just briefly. Uh, last vignette is explaining mode connectivity. And this is again hammering home the point why we should understand these phenomena. What happens along the trajectory? Because things that happen along the trajectory are not true for the entire landscape. Okay, so everybody talks about the landscape. I mean, that's been very popular and fashionable. The landscape of the loss. But there's stuff going on on the trajectory, which is, uh, which is not just a landscape property. All right. So, the way this has been phrased is this, that you take two low-cost solutions to, deep, to some deep learning problem, theta and theta b, so these are parameter vectors. In the parameter space, they can be connected via a piecewise linear path, such that all solutions along this path have low cost. So that's the way it's been phrased. So let me illustrate. So this was in, in, introduced by Freeman and Bruna, and then there have been these follow-up works. And pictorially, here's a landscape, lost landscape for deep learning. And you found two solutions, A and B, which are, so warm colors denote low loss and cool colors denote high loss. So you found two solutions, A and B. You're, for instance, you started with two random initializations, you found these two solutions. In general, they are somewhat different. And if you take the straight line path along those, that passes through high cost regions. So, the, so every point along the path, right, is still a parameter vector, so it corresponds to some deepness, but those have high cost. But you can find a third point, C, says that the straight line connecting A to C and C to B has basically all the nets on those straight lines have the same, or essentially the same cost. This is an empirical fact. This is not theory. Okay, I'm reporting empirical, like very stunning experiments. You know, I was sitting in this uh, New Europe's talk last year or two years ago, I was thinking, that's bizarre. How would you ever have a mathematical explanation for this? So let me just illustrate. Maybe let me say more and maybe then ask your question. So, so I'll, I'll just explain another way. So what, what is this picture showing? So we know that stochastic gradient descent works from random initialization. You start from a random initialization, do gradient descent, you end up in a nice place. So what this suggests is that the landscape, the lost landscape, is full of sinkholes like this. Right? This picture is from New Zealand, actually. So you start at a random point in the parameter space start doing gradient descent, and you go down, and boom, you fall into the sinkhole, and at the bottom is a good net. Right? So that's the picture, mental picture we have. And so people have said, thought about, tried to reason about this using statistical physics models, and like, why does this happen? No, no good explanation. The mode connective phenomenon is even making the picture more interesting. Not only do you fall into a hole by walking a small distance, Mode connectivity is saying that empirically we are finding that the bottoms of the sinkholes are horizontally linked by narrow valleys. And those valleys are flat, you know, the, essentially. The loss stays low. It's a very interesting landscape structure. Why it happens, nobody knows. Okay, so these were striking empirical works. Did I answer the question? 
Okay. All right. So, uh, so um, more or less out of time. So I'll just give you the one minute version. So I, I just want to convince you that this is mathematically a bizarre phenomenon. Okay, and then maybe I won't have time to discuss what we say about it. So let's see it's mathematically bizarre. Because this process of connecting two deep nets with a line in the parameter space is a bizarre thing. So let's, let's do it even for linear nets, right, which we saw earlier in the talk. So x maps to u1, w1 times x. u1 and w1 are matrices. No nonlinearity. So that's a two-layer linear net. And that's another one, u2, w2. Two linear nets in the loss length space. Let's connect them with a the line. So what's the general point on the line along this? It's some other net, which is alpha times the first net plus 1 minus alpha times the second net. So that's also some matrix. It's a, you know, so remember that you're doing it coordinate-wise, right, this interpolation. So it's really this interpolation on the top matrices, top matrices, the two top matrices, interpolation on the bottom two matrices. Right? Every variable gets interpolated. So this is the net you're talking about along the straight line. Now you look at this net and you say, okay, let's open up the product. And you get these four terms from the two terms. So the first one is this u1 times w1. That's the first net. So that's good, right? That's the low, low, low loss net. That's, that's a sensible net. The last one is u2, w2. That's also a good net, right? That was found by gradient descent. But these cross terms, they're bizarre, right? The top layer is from the second net, and the bottom layer is on the first, or vice versa. That's nonsensical, right? They weren't trained together. They were trained independently. There's no reason why the top layer of the first net should work nicely with the bottom layer of the second, right? But somehow, this composite net, the sum of these four nets, has low loss. That's what the empirical research is showing. Bizarre stuff. Now you understand why when I saw this talk a year or two ago, I thought, you know, what's, what's going to be the mathematics of this? All right, so just in a nutshell, so yeah, people have tried to do explanations of mode connectivity. If the network is, has spatial structure and is highly overparameterized, so this is echoes of NTK, roughly that kind of regime, the number of neurons is more than the number of training samples, which is also roughly the NTK regime, then you can show that local minima are, are connected. And uh, the question is, can we do it in more realistic regimes? Okay, where they're mildly, mildly overparameterized, but not this much. So yeah, so that's what we do in this paper, which is in Europe. So we reduce this explanation to the assumption that the net is, has some stability properties. So the first one is called dropout stability, which you've seen, you know, that there's a way to zero out 50% of the nodes at every layer and rescale it appropriately so that the loss doesn't change. So this was introduced by Hinton et al. And there they're doing random dropouts. Here we just need that there exists a way to drop out half the nodes. So it's a much weaker property. So if the net has that, then you can show mode connectivity, okay? That there is a path between them with a small number of segments uh, where the maximum loss is small on the path. And for realistic nets, you know, uh, yeah, so the idea is that you, take, you construct the path in several steps. And the better explanation is using the noise stability property, which has been identified in studies of generalization, why nets generalize. And that implies actually a constant number of linear segments. But remember, the empirical work shows that two linear segments. So that's still not explained by theory. And so I'll conclude. We need to rethink ML theory for non-convex models. Trajectory seems key, because different trajectories on the same object can lead to very different generalization. We need to learn a vocabulary for discussing and working with these trajectories. Uh, and I wish I'd studied some of these subjects more as an undergrad. Uh, what are the other limiting behavior be besides NTK? It's just one limit. There are many other limits definable. Uh, and tighter analysis of mode connectivity, which would be very nice too. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, we have time for a couple questions. Yes. Oh, uh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. So in this case, nothing changed, right? So in other words, uh, the same performance on the line. Correct. So the well, so what we're saying is that an exponential, the set of exponential layered schedules includes as a subset the existing schedules. There might be other interesting schedules. But the one that you described. That's right. Yeah, yeah. The, equal, the, the theory is just that. Empirically, you can, we've tried other variants and those seem promising, but yeah, 
Uh, the theory is exactly what I said, that exponential is a sub superset of existing schedules. So they might be interesting things. As I said, it's a superset. <laughs> so it, you can, of course, give it. Correct. No, 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 no. The proof is saying that every existing schedule is a subset of exponential rate schedules. That's what the proof is showing. That's the. Um, but the one that you can prove will work. That's what it means to prove it's a subset, right? We're showing that this is a subset of those. Of so the exponential. But the exponential. So if you show this set is a subset of this set, you'll show a mapping from this set into this set, right? That's one fine. That's, that's fine. what we are showing. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So so some people seem to be focusing more on the grain descent part and some people seem to be focusing more on the stochastic grain descent part, right? So these are two phenomena that people relate to this implicit regularization. So what is your view on how they're related, how they may be totally independent of each other? Good, that's a great question. So people have uh, wondered about the effect of SGD on, uh, on, uh, uh, on generalization, and that effect is real, right? Several percent. If you just do gradient descent versus stochastic gradient descent, gradient descent stochastic is much better. And there have been these theories involving random walks, you know, all kinds of things. You've seen those. Uh, so I think that's, those theories are still, you know, talking about like, you know, wide optima and so on, right? And uh, you know, it's it's interesting explanation, but you know, I don't think it's fully explaining what's going on with generalization. Uh, and you know, these phenomena suggest. That. Another question? Yeah. Correct. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not a paper about generalization. It is not, but you saw, you know, the paper is actually about generalization. Correct. So the connection between the theory and the treatment and the Yeah, so the question is, you know, what's the theory about generalization? Completely open question. Even for the kernels, we don't understand. Yeah. So, yeah, all the young people here who are looking for something to work on theory, even show me a good generalization theory for kernels. Something that actually works on real life. Okay. Right. Let's thank our speaker one more time.